Hello my dearios, welcome back to the Gentleman Sea Captain's Guide. Now before we start, we will have a little bit of a sea shanty. You'll probably know it, but it's a little more responsible than perhaps you're used to, to reflect these modern times. So I present to you... What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor? What shall we do with a drunken sailor early in the morning? Tell him he's hurting himself and his family. Tell him he's hurting himself and his family. Tell him he's hurting himself and his family. And it's breaking their hearts. It's so unprofessional. It's so unprofessional. It's so unprofessional. Letting down your workmates. He's exceeded his allotted units. He's exceeded his allotted units. He's exceeded his allotted units. Putting them at risk of a serious case of liver damage. Serious case of liver damage. Serious case of liver damage. Possibly cirrhosis. Call a counsellor talk about your problems, call a counsellor to talk about your problems, call a counsellor to talk about your problems, it might be cathartic. Here's a link for a helpful website, here's a link for a helpful website, here's a link for a site with plenty of numbers for support groups. This we do for the drunken sailor, this we do for the drunken sailor, this we do for the drunken sailor, cause we care about him. A rather impromptu shanty, but sometimes we need levity to take our minds off of the horrors of the deep, I'm sure you will agree. But on the subject of alcoholism and salty sea dogs, certainly I have seen many a sailor fall drowning in the bottom of a bottle before he ever came close to drowning in the sea. Certainly there's a lot of terror out there, a lot that could drive a man, a woman, or even a child to drink. And there's not much to drink out there that will keep you alive. I've known many men, in a fit of hysteria, try and drink a bottle of salt water. Sometimes they boil it first, but then they just spoon in the salt residue, as if it was sugar, to help the medicine go down. Alcohol, the sun and the sea can have a, an alarming effect on a sailor, even one with the reputation and strong arms of good old Abernathy, who we've spoken about before. He hit the bottle once or twice. The bottle, the barrel, the keg. He even turned over a pub or two before we put him on the straight and narrow. When we asked him why, why, Henry, why did you turn so deeply to the drink, he had one word for us. Aguanoid. And we, of course, assumed this was a drunken rambling, uh, put him in institution until he was cleaned up. When he emerged, he said to us, Iguanoid, and that's when we knew that he was actually sober at the time, and had rarely <laughs> touched a drop. He had indeed dropped a touch. So what were these Iguanoids? Well, Abernathy, on one of his many voyages out to sea, had encountered them. I am losing the use of my language, but we will carry on because I'm not re-recording that shanty. The Iguanoids <laughs> are a group of reptilian amphibious hybrids, or so I'm told. After all, we all know the Iguana, the great lizard. But... The Iguanoids, they make their dens, their complexes, their vast laboratories at the bottom of the ocean. Now to employ uh, some kind of water-breathing skill, or at least a preference for dwelling beneath the sea. It is likely that the Iguanoids predate humanity on this earth. I know that is an alarming supposition, but here's the fact. We have found one of their cities at the bottom of the sea. We sent down several men in deep-sea diving suits. Could have dispatched a submarine, but they cost an awful lot to rent. And they discovered structures that, at least by their estimations, were thousands of years old. Now, I'm no historian. I don't know how they made that guess. Uh, maybe they took some scratchings and delivered them to an archaeologist or the like. But they said, ooh... At least three to 30,000 years old, and that was good enough for me. So what does this tell us? It tells us the Iguanoids have a desire, and indeed an entitlement, to this planet. 
or at least they feel like they are entitled to it. They feel that we are stewards who have not done a terribly good job with the planet Earth. That they are our predecessors and they have come back to take it. But, the crucial thing, in an interview with an iguanoid that Abernathy told me about, he got in a fist fight with one and when they were reeling from the exhaustion, he asked them, what exactly do you want? The iguanoid said what we wanted, in perfect English, was to wake up several hundred years before now. Henry was, of course, a bit nonplussed by this, swung another punch, uh, cleaned the iguanoid's clock, but went on to talk to him at length after he woke from unconsciousness. You see, the iguanoid explained that their great race had undergone some kind of hibernation since the last great ice age, that they had set themselves up with what they called cryostasis chambers at the bottom of the sea, waiting for the waters to warm up again. Because when everything cooled, they decided they did not like that. This was not the earth they wanted to rule. And so the iguanoids decided they would sleep it off until the sun came out again and the sea temperatures warmed and it was generally all right to play on the beach again. Now, Due to something that went wrong in their systems, and they suspect the sabotage of another race known as the Anurodons that we will get onto at another point, they were kept in stasis in perpetuity. Now what woke them? What woke many of us to this modern world? Nuclear testing. Once the first bombs were dropped over the sea, it would appear one of them detonated above one of these cryostasis chambers, and an emergency lock was released. A hundred or so iguanoids woke from their long slumber. Now it is the iguanoid objective to unlock more of these cryostasis chambers, if only they could remember where in the world they are. After all, many things have changed since the last, days, last ice age, let alone tectonics. You may have thought that the city of your friends was just 100 miles in that way, but the way the plates shift, it's now 100 miles that way, or 300 miles that way. Ah, I don't envy them I'm trying to meet up with old friends and family. But I do struggle to sympathise. You see, while the Iguanoids are not innately an aggressive race, they do have this sense of entitlement. They do feel that humanity may need to be expunged from the surface of this planet to return Earth to the beauty that it once was, the Eden they imagine. And perhaps they do imagine it. You see, the Iguanoids have a low-level mesmerism, a low-level telepathy, that we believe other creatures may have bestowed upon them during their sleep. We believe the iguanoids may have been implanted with these memories and may not be any older than 20 years frozen. But this is a supposition on my part. You see, I've never encountered an iguanoid, uh, but I have encountered one. And when I encountered an iguanoid, the thing that I discovered was a lot of confusion. You see, the iguanoid could recount the exact same past as the one that Abernathy had interviewed, but with no differentiation, no sense of personality, no, my name is this, my family is this, we used to do that before the last great ice age, it was all, the iguanoids do this, as if they've been programmed, you see. The one thing that they do know is they have a racial dislike, uh, dislike is a mild word, for the Anurodon. And the Anurodon is chief suspect for reprogramming the Iguanoid minds while they were in their slumbers. Were they deliberately woken, or was it the nuclear blast that we suspect woke them? We do not know. Right now, our relationship with the Iguanoids is cool to hostile, one could say. We know that at some point they will try and invade. We know that at some point they will try and wake up their fellows from one of the cryostasis chambers, which presents to us the rather ethical quandary of do we destroy these chambers while the iguanoids remain sleeping? Do we try to sue for peace and live in perfect harmony? Maybe the iguanoids being an intelligent race, almost as intelligent as us humans, or we humans if you prefer, 
would be a perfect ally against some of the other aquatic threats, or at least a good source of information, if we can just get past that barrier that is either programmed deep in their minds, or is a shield they put up, because they do not want us to know the truth of what lies beneath the sea. No doubt time will tell. My advice to you if you see one of these iguanoids that look very much like your typical uh, creature from the Black Lagoon, I think is the, the medium of the time, is run the other way. You see, while they're unlikely to just take your head off or shoot you with a laser gun, they're also unlikely to shake your hand and come around for tea. The iguanoids on the surface are looking for something. Whether they're looking for evidence of where their compatriots are currently frozen, whether they're trying to seek information from our governments and military bases, or whether they're just trying to study us, we do not know because, frankly, they are not forthcoming with answers. So that puts us on a footing where we cannot trust them. Worse than any Soviet, the Iguanoid may be laying all the perfect traps for an upcoming invasion, and we need to be ready. So, my advice, the gentleman sea captain advises you, when you see an Iguanoid, turn around, maybe give it a wave, and then walk the other way run if it's coming towards you. Nice advice, nice and simple, but sometimes these creatures are as simple as they look.